Thanks for the invitation to come and have a chat with you today and thanks Margot for that introduction. Um, it is a privilege to be speaking to you here on International Women's Day about data and Indigenous people and some of the work that we've been doing. Um, but before I begin, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we're meeting here today and specifically the Larrakee people on whose sovereign lands that Darwin, Australia was founded, um, where I'm calling in from. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to all of the elders, those of the past, the present and the future. And I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous peoples who are online today. So Nayu Niloa Kalindigraphus, Niloa Corpus, Nayu Yawu Jandu Jandu Buru Bibi. My name is Kalindigraphus, my family name is Corpus, and I am a proud Yawu woman. My country is in Broome in Western Australia. So I am an epidemiologist at the Centre for Big Data Research and Health at the University of New South Wales. And I've worked in research for over 20 years and have been playing with population level data for about 15 of those. Um, and when I say population level, I mean state, territory and national population level data. Um, and so my interest is in the usability of existing data and big linkage data for the purposes of research and community development. So what I thought we could do here today is have a bit of a conceptual talk and contextualise Indigenous data use. I'll highlight some of the critical discussions that are required when we talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in official statistics and data collections. And hopefully this will be useful for people in terms of ideas and strategies for research and community development with Indigenous peoples and communities into the future. I do want to preface that there are a couple of assumptions made in this talk, um, that you all know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the Indigenous peoples of Australia and that I've introduced myself as Yawu now, which is my tribal language group, and that there are about 250 um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, distinct language groups in the nation, and we make up a little over 3% of the national population. Um, I also assume that you know that Australia is a commonwealth and a constitutional monarchy, um, where basically the Queen of England is the head of state, um, with eight mainland states and territories, um, and just let you know that Australia was colonised by the British in 1778. Yes. So full disclosure, I really, really love data, um, but I think in, in this audience I may be preaching to the converted and we know that we're in the data era and we know that data is particularly important for understanding distributions of health and wellbeing within nations, whether it's mapping healthcare services, whether it's developing evidence-based health literacy tools or using community level data to report on community priorities. Data plays a massive role in our understandings of health and society just more generally. But the picture is expansive and it's dynamic. So data is growing exponentially every day. And while data has this incredible potential, there are a range of considerations and gaps regarding the data and data use when working within Indigenous communities. So in 2019, a group of us published a review on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identification, recognising that identification is the central issue in the data collected about Indigenous peoples around the globe. It was one of nine articles from a special issue from five nations discussing the identification of Indigenous peoples in their respective countries. And so the countries included Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States and Brazil. And it arose from a number of global meetings over the past several years with members of the International Group for Indigenous Health Measurement. And it also included working with people from official statistics agencies, governments and international agencies as well. Importantly, previous meetings on how to best measure Indigenous health, specifically the impact of colonisation upon health, highlighted the known invisibility of Indigenous peoples in official data collections. The result of which placed an advocated call to international and national statistical agencies to actually improve these global efforts in the collection of Indigenous data. This raised further discussion about how Indigenous peoples are counted and by whom 
how human rights are met with regard to the right to be counted as Indigenous peoples, as well as highlighting the quality of the information used to report on Indigenous peoples. We thought it was also important to describe some of the critical issues arising when we discuss Indigenous peoples in official statistics. And so there were three overarching international issues, and this included who was counted. So this includes considerations regarding the definitions of Indigenous peoples and the operationalization of those definitions, as well as the propensity to identify. Secondly, how many people are counted. This includes issues of the completeness of the coverage and the accuracy of the counts as well as methods used by national statistical agencies to address those issues of under and over enumeration. And thirdly, what is counted and measured, which involves the development of indicators and measures that encompass Indigenous people's states of events, values and understandings. So the conversation about the context of Indigenous data is often a challenging one to have, but it is central to understanding the tensions in Indigenous data use. So most official data collected by governments on Indigenous peoples is developed within a colonial and racialized context. Um, and what this has resulted in is what we call colonizer sanctioned forms of recognition. What do I mean by this? Well, while the recognition of identity, who we are, can be achieved by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples, we need to be cognizant that the recognition of indigeneity within data has historically been granted by governments. So as an example, the Australian government officially counted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from Federation in 1901 until 1967 for the sole purpose of excluding us from the national population count. In 1967, Australia had a referendum which resulted in the changes to changes in sections 51 and 127 of the constitution. And it was this change to section 127 that resulted in the inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the census. This inclusion only arose from the nation's moral imperative to include and count Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and this was via a democratic vote. Further, it wasn't until 1978 that a Commonwealth definition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was developed, and it wasn't until 1996 that the operationalisation of that definition, the standard Indigenous question, was officially implemented. So our starting point with data is within this paternalistic power differential. Basically, we were allowed to be counted. There are a couple of critical articles within the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other human rights mechanisms as well that provides blue, a, a blueprint um, for nations to discuss and incorporate Indigenous Peoples' rights to the discussion of data and information collection. The first is regarding the right to identify, where Article 33 states that Indigenous Peoples have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions. And look, it's clear that Article 33 highlights the requirement for self-determination in identification. It should also be noted that it purposefully does not specify a definition of Indigenous peoples. Article 15 states, Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. In regards to managing expectations about what happens with the data, Indigenous data governance approaches underpinned by community-led Indigenous data sovereignty principles can be developed in programs and systems that collect information about us within our respective nations. This is the approach to the democratisation of data within the Indigenous context. If data is to be used to tell our stories and our experiences, then we need to be at the table and we need to be aware that we have every right to be so. So I guess the question is, how do we reconcile the hegemonic issues with data and the needs and the aspirations of Indigenous peoples? Well, I don't entirely know, but I think the starting point is through discussions on human rights and Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous data governance and the application of those rights. We need to talk about it more. Data is an asset, and like I said, data can be incredibly powerful. It can be powerful for governments and industry, and it can be powerful for Indigenous communities. So these considerations require much more focus. But what is Indigenous data sovereignty? No doubt you've heard the terms used um, and probably spoken about quite frequently now, um, but 
This is a timeline that we had developed from a review that we did on global Indigenous data sovereignty impact in Australia. And we found that there were a number of principles, issues and needs specific to Indigenous people that have actually been explicitly described since 2004. And look, I've worked in with others to apply kind of practical approaches to the governance of Indigenous data for the past 15 years. However, it was only about five years ago that the first international meeting on Indigenous data sovereignty convened. So the Indigenous data sovereignty literature and language has been developing very quickly over the past five years, which primarily, primarily arises from case studies as well as sociological imaginings. So there's still a lot of work to do to develop this strong evidence base. But back to what is Indigenous data sovereignty? It has been defined by Kukatai and Taylor as the inherent and inalienable rights and interests of Indigenous peoples relating to the collection, ownership, and application of data and information about their people, their lifeways and their territories. And we all know that when we work with data, there are a complex array of intersecting issues across a range of interests. So Indigenous data sovereignty is a way for Indigenous people to describe what is required to ensure self-determination in the way in which data is developed, controlled, maintained, protected and used. It should be noted, however, that Indigenous data sovereignty is a conceptual term and theoretical in nature. So it's applied to Indigenous data governance processes. So if data sovereignty generally is about managing information in the way that's consistent with the laws, practices and custom of the nation state in which it's located, then where do those inherent and inalienable rights and interests of Indigenous peoples fit? Well, the power differential that I spoke about earlier has resulted in limited structures that support Indigenous worldviews, values and understandings in the societies. For me, I see now is the time for valorization. That is applying value and supporting Indigenous worldviews, practices and understandings within non-Indigenous structures, as well as legal and regulatory frameworks that will facilitate ensuring the rights and interests of Indigenous peoples are met. So basically, Indigenous data governance that provides for collective representation of the needs of individuals and their communities. But there is real potential to use Indigenous data governance in reforming data systems to drive Indigenous agendas. When it comes to data for real change, having Indigenous leadership and community identified priorities, needs and aspirations, as well as the strategic uh, partnerships can assist in the ways forward. So as a successful example of the power of using data to prioritise Indigenous needs is um, so some of the work arising from um, the Menzies School of Health Research Cancer Team here in Australia. Now, this has resulted in implementing national policy changes to improve national services and systems for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with cancer. When I first started in cancer epidemiology a little over 10 years ago, we didn't even have national estimates of cancer for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, an important gap in the data on the second biggest killer of Indigenous Australians. We did the first semi-national estimates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people back in 2010, and now there's ongoing national reporting as well as a national framework to tackle cancer. We have worked to improve the data so it can be used to monitor the impact of these implementations and progress it into the future as well. However, there are quite varied differences in whether data is being used for the priorities of governments, research, or for the priorities of Indigenous communities. So the question here is, who speaks on behalf of whom when it comes to data development and use? So from this example, it's clear that Indigenous communities can steer their own ships when it comes to data. So pulling together some of the things that I've mentioned here today, we'll conceptualise it through this diagram. The recognition of Indigenous people requires the acknowledgement of Indigenous people and includes how Indigenous peoples are described and defined. This should be in alignment with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. While Australia does quite well relative to other nations in regards to data capture and recognition about systems and data supporting our right to self-determination and community advancement, um, we really need more improvement in this area. We also need to talk about operations. How do we best build data assets that reflect the aspirations of Indigenous people and build the capability of the next generation of Indigenous data nerds? Some of the work at the Indigenous Data Network in Australia 
is about developing community controlled data assets and building the technical capability of Indigenous communities. We also need to recognise who are setting the priorities regarding data use to benefit the aspirations of Indigenous people and their communities. We always need to be asking the question, who are the we in this discussion? I'm going to finish up here, um, but I do want to say that I think as we move forward, um, there are a lot of challenges in Indigenous data use. It's complex, multifaceted and dynamic. Um, to take it on well, it requires innovative solutions that, I guess, are Indigenous value focused and engages partnerships and collaborative efforts. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you.